This is Lunchtime Agenda. G'day and welcome to the program. I'm David Lipson. There's been more criticism of Tony Abbott's front bench selection today. Australia's chief scientist, Ian Chubb, has described as a pity the fact that there is a Minister for Sport but no Minister for Science. Tony Abbott's bloke-heavy front bench has also drawn criticism with just one woman in Cabinet, a total of six women on the front bench out of around 127 MPs and Senators. It's made an easy target for the Labor opposition. Uh, when you have a look at this cabinet lineup, they've made some um, early mistakes, I have to be honest. Uh, maybe it's inexperience, maybe it's their values. The idea that you'd only have one woman in the top 20 uh, ministers in Australia is ridiculous. Um, the idea that they wouldn't refer to disability when everyone knows people with disabilities have been shut out of the system for so long is ridiculous. But it's not just those blunders they've made. They don't have a Minister for Science. You've got to go back to 1931. We'll hear more from Ian Chubb a little later in the show. Australia, the Australian of the Year, I should say, has also added some fuel to this debate. Ida Buttrose saying it's proof that a glass ceiling still does exist in Australia. Let's hear what our panel thinks today on Lunchtime Agenda. Joining me is the Labor MP Kelvin Thompson and Liberal MP Jane Prentice. Thank you both very much Thank for joining us. Pleasure. Good afternoon, David. Jane. First to you, Jane Prentice. Were you disappointed that there weren't more of your female colleagues in Tony Abbott's inner circle or on the front bench? Well, actually, the result was fairly predictable. Tony said all along uh, that he was going to be a stable team. Uh, the team he has are those who've served with him now for four years. They're incredibly experienced. Uh, they're actually more experienced in some of their portfolios than Labor ministers ever were because of being consistently with Tony working together over the last four years. Now, two things happened. We had one member uh, who looks as though she may lose her seat and she said, please name your ministry without me, and that was Sophie. Uh, and so we lost one woman. And then Tony, of course, had to find someone he could rely on who'd be strong uh, and competent in the role of speaker. And he asked Bronwyn if she'd be prepared to do it. Uh, so he mm. lost two women. Uh, and that's a tragedy, but the bottom line is that the makeup of that team is very much the same as it was three years ago. So is the problem then that uh, only 18 of, of the 90 members of the lower house are women? Is it, is it that the pool that he had to draw on just wasn't lar large enough of women? Does that su suggest that it's a systemic problem? Well, no, what I'm saying is that the team he has now is the team he had minus two from three years mm. ago, four years ago in opposition. He has a stable team. He knows mm. he's got some challenges ahead, so that's why he wants the same people with him. He's not Jane about Jane Prentice, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We, we've got to go to the interim Labor leader, Chris Bowen. He's just started speaking at a news conference in Sydney. We'll come back to this panel. One woman to serve in the Cabinet of Australia. John Howard's first Cabinet, uh, a long time ago, had two women. Uh, we had six women in the outgoing cabinet. All cabinet appointments should be based on merit. Uh, we had six talented women who were appointed on merit to the cabinet. And for Tony Abbott to say that he could only find one woman, in his view, talented enough to serve in the federal cabinet of Australia, is a sad indictment. Uh, this has been uh, supported by Senator Boyce. And I saw uh, Mr Dennis Jensen earlier today uh, say that the a Cabinet wasn't being appointed on merit. Also, we pointed out that there are great gaps in this Cabinet. No Minister for Science, no Minister for Skills, no mo Minister for Multiculturalism, no Minister for Ageing or Seniors, and no Minister for Disability Care. Now, it's all very well to say somebody's responsible in the Cabinet, uh, but it's important for a government to highlight its priorities, uh, to highlight specific responsibilities for its most senior ministers. Australia's had a science minister since the early 1930s. James Scullin as Prime Minister knew that science was important enough to have a portfolio, but Tony Abbott seems to think it's not. And again, uh, Dennis Jensen said earlier today uh, that this was uh, a problem. He said he was confused uh, by this policy and he said it wasn't too late for Mr Abbott to change his mind and to put his to put a science portfolio forward. 
Also today, Mr Jensen has agreed with the, exactly the points we've been making about the paid parental leave scheme of Mr Abbott. We pointed out it was too expensive and that it would be paid for by Australia's self-funded retirees and seniors. Mr Jensen called for it to go to the Productivity Commission and said that it was being paid for by a whack on Australia's seniors. He said it was something somebody had thought of and hadn't properly been thought through. Well, Mr Jensen's telling the truth. And he's saying exactly what we said before the election. Mr Jensen is saying it after the election, uh, in a sign of disunity, before the new government has even been sworn in, that we made these points before the election. So again, we're seeing what is frankly, in my view, a botched cabinet uh, reshuffle, uh, key portfolios being left off, uh, the embarrassment of only one woman being put into the cabinet, and key liberal backbenchers pointing out uh, the errors in the paid parental leave scheme, which will be paid for by Australia's seniors, self-funded retirees, part, pension, part pensioners and mum and dad investors. Happy to take some questions. Chris, why do you think he has only appointed one woman? Well, that's a matter for him to explain. He said that there were talented women knocking on the door to get into Cabinet. Well, Prime Minister-elect, open the door. Uh, let them into the Cabinet. There are, I say in a spirit of bipartisanship, there are women in the Liberal and National Party rooms who do have ability uh, and should be represented at the most senior a policy making table in Australia. As I say, all, poli all uh, appointments should be made on merit. Uh, I happen to think it's a very sad day in 2013 if the Prime Minister elect of Australia says I made my appointments on merit and only one out of 20 of those appointments on merit is a female. So why do you, who do you think then should have been appointed as well, opposed to the male counterparts? Well, there's a whole range of people in the Liberal and National Party rooms. It's not my place. Um, to appoint Liberal and National Party ministers. Uh, but I could point to a whole range of them. Some of them still on the back bench. Uh, Kelly O'Dwyer, um, some, in the, some parliamentary secretaries uh, who should be uh, very seriously considered for uh, cabinet positions. Are you saying the male counterparts who have been um, put into to the cabinet, do you think that they haven't been won on merit? Well, what I'm saying, or well, uh, Dr Jensen said that, and what I'm saying is that if the Prime Minister elect of Australia in 2013 uh, thinks that on merit he can only find one woman out of his entire combined Liberal and National Party rooms, I think that's a sad day for Australia. Do you think of a lot of that campaigning he did with his daughters and, you know, uh, and all the other women he was around, do you think that was a sham? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying uh, what is important is matters of substance and important appointments of substance, and none are more important than appointments to the Federal Cabinet of Australia. Uh, and uh, I think it's a sad indictment that in this modern era, uh, a new Prime Minister can only find one female who he thinks is up to the job of serving in the Federal Cabinet. Mr Bowen, will you be publicly boosting either Mr Albanese or Mr Shorten? No, I won't. I'm, I've made that very clear several times, Jared. I won't be endorsing either candidate as interim leader of the Labor Party. That will would you, be inappropriate. Will you be attending either of their campaign functions? No. Capacity? No. Uh, if there were any joint functions which are both attending, I would consider that, but I won't be attending any functions that are uh, only supporting one of them. I know we're, we're rather early on in the process, but uh, can, is there anything you can point to at the moment that will tell us uh, uh, how the um, how this uh, issue is going, how it's playing with the membership and so forth? Well, it's very popular uh, with the members in terms of getting a vote, and we've been, um, I'm, I'm told, uh, deluged with applications to join the Labor Party uh, in the last few days. Uh, now, people who join the Labor Party now, of course, won't get a vote. It's people who are a member of the Labor Party uh, on election day he'll get a vote. That's an important thing. Uh, it's a, it's a, a development that I support, that uh, everybody, every financial member of the ALP right up to election day get a vote, uh, gets to have a say in who is our alternative Prime Minister. Uh, that's a good thing and I think it will re-energise our branch membership. Uh, we, don't, we want people to join the Labor Party, but we don't want them to just join the Labor Party and hand out on election day. We want people's involvement right across the country, suburbs, regions, inner city, um, bush, uh, all across the country, small business people, farmers, unionists, students, uh, retirees. We want all sorts of people involved in the Labor Party and playing a role in the important decision about who shall lead the Labor Party. You mentioned before about the fact that there is no science, science minister. What effect does that have? I mean, it is still being shared across to, to other ministers. Well, you need a science minister at the table uh, making the case for science. If you talk to the science community, they will tell you, for example, that Barry Jones uh, was a very important uh, science minister. Kim Carr 
uh, was somebody who understood science and still understands science and understands the importance of public policy for science. There are a whole range of areas, whether it be science, whether it be resources and tourism are another example, so important in our economy. I mean, the Labor Party gave the resources sector two talented ministers who understand the resources sector as well as anybody else in the country, Martin Ferguson and Gary Gray. Now we find the entire portfolio has been abolished uh, and you've got apparently resources being thrown in with manufacturing, with science, with industry uh, and I don't think uh, that those key areas of the economy will get the necessary attention. Financial services is another field, an area of great potential for Australia. I'm a former financial services minister who sat at the cabinet table. I know uh, what, difference it ha what difference it makes to have a minister uh, dedicated to improving the lot of one particular part of, us, of the Australian economy, and this is sadly lacking in this new cabinet. Does it surprise you that so, uh, so far after the election you're still the Treasurer? Uh, well, uh, we had a budget emergency which needed to be fixed urgently, apparently. That's no longer the case. Uh, now, we, now we hear that the mid-year economic forecast won't be released until January when you will all be, I hazard a guess, on holidays in an attempt to avoid a scrutiny. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, symptomatic of the saying one thing before the election and doing another thing after the election. If we had a budget emergency, well, Mr Abbott could have see, sought to have himself sworn in by now. He could have sought to have Mr Hockey sworn in by now. And he could have uh, put in place the measures that he thinks are so urgent. Instead, we see not only no swearing in, uh, but I see speculation that the a new Treasurer is going to spend more money, uh, add to debt. Uh, when I thought that debt was a national emergency, uh, I see that uh, the Prime Minister-elect, who said he'd go to Indonesia in his first week in office, is now uh, not doing that, and uh, Minister Bishop will catch up with Minister Natalagawa for a coffee in New York. Uh, so we're seeing a very different approach from before the election uh, to after the election from this new government. Do you think a lot of his promises are going unanswered? I think uh, he uh, campaigned saying one thing and his governing doing something completely different so far. OK, I think we're covered. Right. Thank Thanks very much, guys. Cheers. That's the interim Labor leader, Chris Bowen, speaking there in Sydney. I want to return to our panel, Kelvin Thompson and Jane Prentice. And to you, Jane Prentice, sorry for interrupting you there. I do want to continue on that point. You were talking about stability. I understand that stability is important. It's what Tony Abbott always promised. But the reality is that now we have an Abbott government and there are just six female front benches, which, uh, as, uh, well, Chris Bowen believes, it's a sad indictment on, uh, on Australia and on, on the government. What, what's your response to that? Yes, but you can't seriously suggest that we should be changing everyone now after we have a team that has worked together for four years, that has achieved great things to the extent that we've won the election, and now you want us to change them to accommodate women for the sake of women. We have an experienced team there. Tony needs to move ahead to uh, fix the problems that we have with waste and productivity, and he needs the people who he's been working with for four years. There wasn't this sort of outcry three years ago when he named uh, his shadow front bench then. Uh, and all that's happened is we've had two incidents, uh, one with Sophie uh, and her struggle in Indi. And, of course, you want the best person to be Speaker, and that's obviously Bronwyn Bishop for this role. Kelvin Thompson, so on, on those a... points, on, on those points, Kelvin Thompson, giving, giving uh, you know, uh, surely uh, talent has to be the, the, the first consideration. And Tony Abbott, as Jane Prentice was saying, always said that stability was very important. Are we making this point too late? Uh, David, I think it's a bit rich that when during the election campaign we saw Tony Abbott with his wife and his daughters at the campaign launch there sending out the message that he was a new age, modern kind of guy, comfortable with women and yet after the election we see that when they, the Cabinet meets uh, you'll probably have Julie Bishop off overseas somewhere and it'll be a room full of blokes talking about the NRL. Uh, they probably won't be talking about the AFL because the first ranked Victorian is Kevin Andrews at number 11 and the Victorian representation <laughs> has been cut back. And, and in terms of this question of, uh, 
uh, keeping the existing team. Uh, Therese Gambaro was a uh, shadow parliamentary secretary and yet she has been dropped from the, the team altogether. You've got uh, women like Sharman Stone who entered the parliament uh, the same time I did, way back in 1996, who uh, has ministerial experience. As far as I know, she's available for selection being overlooked. So I, I don't think there's any excuse for the outcome. OK, we have to take a break, but we'll be back with more right after this. Don't go away. Are you the type of traveller who loves a red-hot deal? Like Bangkok, four nights from $179. Bali, seven nights four star from $289. Gold Coast, four nights four and a half star from $209. Or Fiji, four nights from $235. And we'll beat any airfare quote or you fly free. Call 131 600 anytime. We're always here. We trust Woolworths with the weekly shopping because we always get great value. It's the same reason I got my car insurance from Woolworths. Car insurance from Woolworths has a great range of features for a great Woolworths price. And if you take out a new Woolworths car insurance policy right now, you'll also receive a $50 petrol gift card for free. Get a quote today. Call Woolworths Insurance on 1300 781 281 or go to WoolworthsCarInsurance.com. This year, Jetstar celebrates our 10th year. But it's not what we've done, it's what we're about to do that really excites us. We'll help millions of people connect with their loved ones, their jobs, their dreams. We'll introduce fabulous new destinations and new ways to make travel more accessible, more affordable and more enjoyable. And we'll introduce the amazing Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It's going to be a great experience. So get on board, Australia. At Jetstar, low fares are just part of the story. At night, Mum leaves. She works with men. She has no choice. She doesn't want that life for me. Thanks to child sponsors, World Vision helps kids here stay in school so my sister and I can be safe from the dangers of life on the streets. Help protect children from a life of exploitation. Sponsor a child today. Call 13 32 40 or visit worldvision.com.au. Suncorp Bank is big on the things that really count. Like having genuine conversations with customers to help them structure their loans to pay their homes off sooner. Bank Genuine. Suncorp Bank. Suzuki's 1000 Cars 10 Day Sale is on with great offers across the range like Swift with Bluetooth and audio streaming from just $14,990 drive away. That's our lowest Swift price ever. Suzuki's 1000 Cars 10 Day Sale at your Suzuki dealer now. Simply type in a name and let Ancestry guide you through the world's largest online collection of family history records. Ancestry.com.au. Discover your story. Thanks for your company on Lunchtime Agenda. I'm still joined by Kelvin Thompson and Jane Prentice. We've been talking about Tony Abbott's front bench. We've covered the, the woman or women issue largely. I just wanted to also touch on... Uh, where there has been some criticism on some portfolios that no longer exist, at least in title, Jane Prentice. Some of the criticism we heard there from Chris Bowen that uh, uh, ministries like uh, aged care, like disabilities, uh, you know, um, is it a problem that these, these ministries have disappeared? Science is another one. Well, David, the ministries haven't disappeared. All that no. Tony's done is streamlined some of the names. And quite frankly, uh, the Labor government was out of control with its sort of uh, double line titles for all its ministers. It was all about show. It should be about the substance. And I'm very confident that Ian McFarlane will be a great minister for science. And I know the Queensland Minister for Science and Innovation uh, said today that he looks forward to working with 
uh, McFarlane and achieving things for the science community. The bottom line also is that when you look at the other members uh, in the coalition, you don't have to be a minister to be an advocate for science and the research sector. And you've got uh, Dr Jensen and, uh, and I've always been a strong advocate for the science and research sector. And we're not going to sit there quietly and not say anything. We're going to be continuing to advocate uh, for those uh, particular areas. I know Julie Bishop's been a great supporter of the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array in the Pilbara. Mm. Uh, they're still going to have your champions uh, in the parliament and we'll make sure uh, that those areas are addressed. Well, the chief Australian scientist, Ian Chubb, believes it's a pity that there's a minister for sport and not for science. I spoke to him a little earlier. Well, that's a bit of a pity. I mean, I personally, I like sport too, um, but I love science. So, uh, um, and, and I think science is critical to our future as a country. Uh, to us as Australians and to Australia's place in the world. I mean, we have to be a contributor to the world's um, attempted solutions to some of the problems that confront humanity or confront the planet. Kelvin Thompson, surely just having a title for some of these portfolio areas it doesn't make you automatically a better government or care more about those issues, does it? Uh, David, I think that our administrative arrangements have become very complicated and confusing over the years and that there is a case for simplification, but I think that Tony Abbott's minimalist approach goes too far and that you do need and can have a Minister for Science, a Minister for Disabilities, a Minister for Tourism, a Minister for Financial Services, and that if you've got someone who, when they get up out of bed of a morning, it is their job to work hard in that express portfolio area. I I think that those areas will profit from having someone championing their cause and it's a shame that those areas have fallen off the radar. So, uh, you know, there is obviously a limit though to the number of front bench positions that Tony Abbott can put in place. So you're saying that he should have given several ministers several different portfolios? No, I don't think that was necessary, David. Uh, what he's put in place in the outer ministry is uh, ministers assisting, ministers assisting in areas like education and health and social services. And, and I think rather than doing that, he would have been better off going for an express minister for science, an express minister for tourism, an express minister for disabilities with some of those outer ministries. I think that would have been the better way to go. Kelvin Thompson, you've said that you're reasonably happy about uh, being on the backbench for the opposition rather than being parliamentary secretary as you, as you were before because it enables you to speak more freely on some issues that you really care about, like a stable population. Uh, can you expand a little bit on, on why you're pleased about being able to speak out on these issues? Uh, David, I think, uh, unfortunately, when you're a member of the, the executive, a minister or a parliamentary secretary, uh, you are obliged uh, not to speak outside your portfolio. And when you do speak within your portfolio, uh, often you find these things have to be cleared with the prime minister's office or the leader of the opposition's office and, and so on. I think uh, that is very limiting uh, in a world which I think has real challenges and real problems. And uh, I do think that uh, the world and Australia have serious population issues. Uh, the global population up to 1950 was less than 2 billion and yet in the, uh, the course of the last decades it has more than trebled. It's now 7 billion tracking for 9, 10 billion by 2050 and that that is the underlying cause of so many of our global problems. Uh, global warming, uh, food shortages, water shortages, uh, war, waste, terrorism, species extinctions, uh, uh, fisheries collapse, uh, uh, urban sprawl, all of these mm. things uh, are generated by the rapid population growth which we've seen globally and which we're seeing here in Australia as well. We're, we're experiencing massive population growth in Australia compared with years gone by and that is generating yeah, okay. problems as well. All right, well, Kelvin Thompson, Jane Prentice, apologies, but we are out of time. But thank you very much for your insights and uh, thoughts this afternoon. And thanks very much for watching Lunchtime Agenda. I'm David Lipson. Selena Edmonds will be up with Newsday and all the latest headlines in just a moment.